suggestion to come forward, please. Okay. Is Mr. Mark? Yeah, he's dealing with the situation outside. There we go. Okay, friends, it's good to be back. We doing okay out there? Yeah, I think we think so. Okay. <laughs> Good, good. Good to be back with you folks. Um, some uh, famous pastor said, lonely sucks. Oh, that was Mark. <laughs> 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 he said that. <laughs> um, so, um, life has had some interesting twists and turns the last while for me. November 8, 2022, my wife died. And um, two months later in January, I was in the Emanuel gym, and a lady a little older than me came up to me and said, what's your name? I said, Kanak. She said, how old are you? I said, well, I was kind of 78. I kind of went, well, what's your name? <laughs> she was kind of one of those ladies. What's your name? <laughs> She said, uh, I think I got the right guy. She said, do you remember Marjean? Yeah, I remember Marjean. Remember from college? Uh, and she said, well, that's my niece. She said, well, three years ago, she lost her husband. And uh, she's up in Spokane, Washington. I said, OK. So that was a year and a half ago or so. And so uh, a few months back, the light bulb went on. Oh, yeah, Marjean. I remember Marjean. I dated her for, short, for a short time in college. <laughs> so I went on public domain and I found uh, Marjean's uh, phone number. And uh, I actually called that number and it didn't answer. And I, I found her son, sent her son a text. Her son text 
texted Marjean that I had tried to get a hold of her, and so Marjean sent me a text and said, what's up, dude? <laughs> no, she didn't say that. <laughs> 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 so I FaceTimed her, and uh, we've been FaceTiming ever since. And uh, so this last week, I flew up to Spokane for the second time, and I took a big rock with me, and uh, we're engaged. <laughs> Thank you. We were married this summer. Uh, she's just a, a wonderful, wonderful gal. She's married to a pastor. They were pastoring up and down Alaska for a while, and uh, down into uh, the Northwest, and ended up in Spokane the last 10 years. Three years ago, she went through a miserable death, just like I did. Her husband got COVID, and she did too. She was nursed to health at home. I guess they thought her husband was bad enough. They took him to the hospital, put him on the stupid medication, made things worse, put him on a ventilator, down here from there. She had to go in with a hazmat suit on, and the kids one at a time, and say goodbye. And she finally had to say, we can't let this man suffer anymore. So I had to let it go. And uh, she has rebounded really well. She's doing good. Uh, she's a really uh, special lady. She's very talented. She's an artist. She's a writer. She's an editor. Leads a women's Bible study up in their church in Spokane. And uh, she says, you got to come up and meet my ladies. They all want to meet you. So I went up there and went all that was fun, fun church. And uh, she has four kids. And uh, so while I was up there, we had dinner with her daughter lives a half a mile away. She, uh, Marjean is really, I mean, she walks every day and walks down to her daughters and uh, it's her best friend. They talk all the time. So we had dinner with this family. And her daughter is a really talented lady herself. She was a pre-med student, got married, and then um, I asked my marriage and family class, I tell them, there's a fundamental question you're going to have to ask yourself when you get married. Who do you want to raise your kids? And so she said, I do. And she stopped. She was, she's not a doctor. She stopped after college and said, I'm going to my family. And so they have eight kids. <laughs> and she's homeschooling all of them. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> and uh, we went over for dinner. It was an impressive sight. Marjean, myself, and her daughter, and her, and her husband, and eight kids, plus a cousin. There's nine of them on this big table, big wooden table. They're all sitting around the table ages 8 to 19, visiting like young adults with no cell phones. <laughs> That's impressive. <laughs> it was really neat. Wonderful family. And I said, Marjean, you're, you're leaving a lot behind. Your best friend's right around the corner. You have a wonderful church. You have a Bible study, a lot going on. But like Pastor Mark said, lonely is tough. And she was lonely. She said, well, I'm right next to my daughter, but they're so busy with eight kids, sports and school and all the stuff they do. And so I'm busy too, but you go home and you're alone. And so to a lonely widower and lonely widow, <laughs> we're getting together. <laughs> and so um, she's really a trust Lord. She actually loves Jesus more than she does me. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> I hope somebody say amen. There I got it. <laughs> Yes, yes, very special. So uh, we're just walking with the Lord, trusting Him. Um, Going to go up there uh, in July and be married and bring her back to the farm. He said, I'm raising a farm, so uh, John was telling me, the old farm place, so built through the house uh, 16 years ago out there, so bring her to the farm house. And we're going to... When you want. come to preach again, I'll bring her with you. I will. And of course, you can bring Jesus. Too. I hope I can come back. <laughs> you can bring Jesus too. Amen. Get amen for me. Okay. Uh, so much for that. Um, oh. <laughs> Four of her bridesmaids she has kept in contact with all these years. She was married 52 years just like I was. And all those years she's kept on. Three of them live in Fresno. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, and one of them is in San Jose. She's coming down uh, the middle of May, I mean, 19th or so, and um, to meet my family. She hasn't met my kids yet, grandkids. And 
So if they're going to come over and get reacquainted with, uh, or, or get together over at my house out the farm, so that's going to be fun. They were kind of teasing each other. Margie said, well, she's 75, I'm 79. I was really looking for a younger man. <laughs> I know I'm young at heart. I hang around teenagers every day, so I, I act kind of goofy too much. She's kind of getting used to my goofiness. But uh, so they said her said to her, "Well, when he proposed, I got down on one knee, and they said, well, if he got back up, that's probably a pretty good sign." <laughs> We're back up and running. <laughs> Thank you for your love. I feel here. So, so good. Okay. We have it. We have love for you. I know. I feel You're it. You're a great guy. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's a wonderful, warm place. Okay. Uh, today, I'm going I'm to share with you why I choose to believe and trust the Bible. Uh, that is kind of part of a bigger picture we call apologetics. Apologetics has gotten real popular in terms of teaching, writing, seminars, and so forth and so on, because apologetics, it's really unfortunate that English has taken the word apologize. It sounds like apologetics, and it kind of is. And it's just the opposite. Christians don't apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm a Christian. You're a Christian? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, we don't apologize for that. The word apology actually means to defend. And so apologetics is all about defending. So how do you do that? You need to know what you believe, why you believe it, and how to articulate it. And one of the big apologetic questions is, what's your source of authority? Where do you go to answer the hard questions of life? And there are many hard questions in life. We all face them. Uh, I faced a really hard one, one of the toughest ones, uh, up to a year and a half ago, uh, when our five-year-old son started having seizures. Wow, what do you do with that? I mean, you'd have all been there and all that stuff. Uh, so seizures, death... You know, what is it? Where do they go? What about their body? How do I respond? Uh, meaning of life? What do I do with my life? Is there a purpose of meaning and marriage and kids and jobs? And, you know, all these hard, where do you go for your authority? How do you find out exactly what we should do, what God wants us to do? The typical answer was, I was raised that way. A lot of people say that. Well, why do you believe the Bible? Well, I was raised to believe it. Why are you a Christian? Well, I was raised that way. Okay. Well, uh, I was raised in a very conservative Mennonite home. And as a youth, I didn't think too much of that. And uh, some of the things I didn't think were too cool. And as a, uh, through high school, my parents and the church said, don't go to movies. Well, okay, well, I'll show you. So I got to college, went to a movie. Somebody said, oh, you gotta see this movie. Great. I don't want to give you the name. Anyway, <laughs> so I went to see the movie, right? And I'm in college now. Big boy. Okay, that was in 1963. I will tell you the name of the movie. In the movie, there was a bedroom scene. In 1963, it wasn't nudity. It was just suggestive. Okay? We knew where they were headed. They didn't show all the intricate details, but it was, it was, it was a bedroom. Okay? If I want to, I can pull up that on my computer because it's there. I don't want to, and I don't. It's there. So you know what? My parents don't go to movies. It was a pretty good idea. Movies are so impressionable. We sit in a movie house and big screen. Like I tell my students, you got you got the, the sound stuff that rumbles your buns. You sit there and it really it really t takes you in. Movies are powerful. We have a movie generation. People come up and they watch so much stuff in their computers. You know, the old junior high youth pastors deal about your brain's like a hard drive. I believe that. They tell us the stuff is there that sometimes it'll suddenly come out and dream. I don't have a lot of bad dreams. The other night, I had a bad dream about something a long time ago. Where did that come from? It's there. And so that's the way I was raised. Okay? I had a student in class who was one of the nicest girls I have ever had in my 52 years of teaching. She was a sweetheart. On top of that, occasionally I took my wife, Nancy, to the campus, and she got to know this girl. And uh, this girl would literally leave her friends and come running over to hug Nancy. When Nancy, when she saw Nancy on campus, I'll take her to chapel sometimes. Well, that, sweetest, one of the sweetest girls I've ever met. 
She was raised in a Sikh home. I told her one time, I said, now you know, the Bible's clear, there's only one way to God is through Jesus Christ. You know what she said? Well, you know I'm a Sikh, right? You can do it. I've only begged the Lord for a few things in my life. One of them was so my wife wouldn't die in pain or confusion. He answered that prayer. My wife died in peaceful death. I begged the Lord for that girl's salvation just about every day. What's going on? She was raised that way. When you're raised that way, it's there. There's no, there's, it, there's a very good reason why God said, train up a child in the way he should go. So we got to do training and we got to do it right. And who's going to raise your kids? By far the best model of training and raising is parents. Another typical answer, why do you believe the Bible? Why are you a Christian? Well, I tried it and it changed my life. No, that sounds pretty good. Okay, well, Amen. other people have tried things and it changed their life. Uh, there was a young man, Dr. Bodibachum tells this story. There was a young man who got into big trouble, went into prison. In prison, he got saved. Totally changed his life. He went out and converted many people. In fact, today there are a whole bunch of churches across the, our country today named after him. You know his name is? Malcolm X. That's Muslim. He got saved. It changed his life. He went from being a horrible person, getting the big trouble, getting in prison, becoming a model citizen. Started churches. Muslim churches. Changed my life? Great. It should change your life. But that can't be the basis of who we are. Well, I'm a different person. Where'd that come from? We're talking about the Word of God. We're not talking about a small thing here. Peter. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths. And that's what they are. Those cleverly devised myths, the Sikhs, the Mormons, the Muslims, they're cleverly devised myths myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty uh, that same man Dr. Vody Bakum is more on the, on the east coast and he has done a lot of speaking there I have a video of him I play for my class here's what he said he said I choose to believe the Bible because it's a reliable collection of historical documents written by eyewitnesses during the lifetime of other eyewitnesses who report supernatural events in fulfillment of specific prophecies and the book claims to be divine. Okay, now, you want to follow that? Or you, or you want to join the crowd of 17 million people who follow the Mormons? Joseph Smith, one man, claimed he got gold tablets and the angel of Moroni appeared to him. Nobody saw that. Nobody's ever seen the gold tablets. And he claims this is all from God. And 17 million, million people follow that. <laughs> How can you do that? The Islams, Muhammad. He said Gabriel appeared to him and recited part of the Quran to him and told him he was a prophet from God. One man, one event, wrote some stuff down. 1.9 billion people follow that cleverly designed, designed myth. It's unbelievable. So just that's the way I was raised, just to change my life. It's got to be more than that. Yes, God should change our lives. Spurgeon said, you don't need to defend a lion anymore. You need to defend the Bible. You just turn it loose and he'll defend himself. That's true of the Word of God. Our lives are going to come from the book. Our sharing, our teaching. What did Jesus do when he was personally confronted by Satan? He quoted scripture. So the power of the word, and there's no higher authority to appeal into the Bible. So it's an accurate collection, it's a reliable historical documents. It's been proven over and over that the Bible is reliable. Talk about some guy, oh, we never heard that. Who was that guy anyway? The final archaeological thing, you just if you want to just follow archaeology, find, oh, okay, well, there he is. Oh, yeah, okay, the Bible. Let's go find another one. That's what they do. Okay. It's written on three different continents, Asia, Africa, Europe. God's message to man, to us, came from different places. God transcends space. He wanted his message to come from different parts of the world. 
So it's written. The Bible's written three different languages. God wants his message to be understood. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew, which was the primary language of the Jewish people. It was first primarily written to the Jews in the language. They understood. Then the New Testament was written in Koni, uh, Koni whatever you pronounce that word, you pronounce a couple names. It was used in Greek for international communication, but also the first language of many Jews. What's the point? God wanted his message to be understood. Written by over 40 different authors, not Joseph Smith, not just, not just one man. 40 different authors wrote the book. All kinds of life. Shepherds, fishermen, doctor, tax collector, farmers. What's interesting is none of them were professional writers. There were people. God wanted his message to come through people. He's chosen to use people. He's chosen to use me and you in different ways. God wanted his message to come from different people. Bible has 66 volumes in it. And history, narrative, poetry, prophecy, parables. What's the point? God's message comes in different styles. Some people are just poetic people. And so they're going to be more drawn to the poetry. More people are just, they love a great story. So these different styles, God wants us in the book. And it was written over 1,500 years. The first five books written by Moses in about 1,400 B.C. And the last book by John in about 100 A.D. God and his message transcends time. 1,500 years the Bible is written. Not one time, not one vision, so-called vision, not one gold tablets. So this book we have is just an incredible book. You take a look at all the factors related to it. The heart and soul for us Christians are the four Gospels. Because it's the life of Christ. So why four? Why four? It's a really interesting question. I, I hope you've thought about it a little bit. I think there's some, a lot of different answers we could come up with. Um, Matthew was primarily interested in addressing a Jewish audience. He starts with the genealogy. Why does he do that? A lot of people genealogy. Pass over that. I no longer pass over the genealogy. I just read one in 1 Kings. I'm looking for names I recognize, and I highlight them. There's reasons for the genealogies. Matthew wanted to trace the genealogy of Christ. Christ has the rightful place on the throne of David. He also shows that Jesus came to get the job done. There are more miracles and works than in the other Gospels. In Mark, he wanted the people in the Roman Empire who were not familiar with Jewish history, it's an account of action. Uh, he shows that Jesus came to get the job done. And Mark is brief and it's to the point. There's people like that that enjoy that more. You may or may not be drawn to more one of the four Gospels more than the others, but there's more. Luke writes to, to the analytical mind. He says, I want to give an accurate account of the events. He also emphasized the humanity of Christ, the Son of Man. Luke was not an eyewitness, but he writes from the testimonies of other eyewitnesses, especially Mary and Peter. John is a lot of people's favorite books. In fact, I, I tell people, hey, I'm, I want to start reading the Bible. Where do I start? You know, don't start in Revelation. Don't start with Song of Solomon. Don't start with Ecclesiastes. I recommend, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I recommend people start with the Gospel of John. John was probably the best friend Jesus had humanly on, on the earth. Probably two closest people to, to Jesus were John and Mary, his mother. And it just so happens that one of the most touching scenes in all the Bible is on the cross, and Jesus paraphrased here by my grandpa cannot hear. John, I'm leaving. I need somebody to take care of my mom. John, you're the guy. Behold your mother, right? So John, uh, John and Mary were not close, and so John, I call it our go-to guy. John's goal was to show that God loved the whole world. The most famous verse in the whole Bible, right? John 3.16, God loved the whole world. So, what authority do you and I go to for life's questions? Life has many tough questions. It has not been an easy, uh, easy um, question to answer for me. And Marjean and I have talked about this. I'm almost 80. Should I get married? I've told her. We've already had to put somebody in the box. One of us is going to have to do it again. Do we want to do that? Uh, lots of questions. There are hard questions. So where do you go? 
What's the Word have to say? A lot. And so she's in the Word, I'm in the Word, we're praying a lot, and we feel like God is bringing us together. And we don't know about tomorrow. Nobody has. Nobody does. Thank you. I, yes. Amen. Amen about that. She's kind of influenced by one of her bridesmaids. Her bridesmaid lost her husband a few years back, and she met a man who was 20 years older than her. And they got married. His kids didn't like it because they thought she was marrying him just for his money. Which is really sad because they love each other. <clears throat> so uh, he's now 98 and they're still carting around the country traveling and having a blast. <laughs> so you don't know about tomorrow or they've had you know, a whole bunch of years together and having a great time together. So where do we go? Those tough questions. This requires study, folks. You've got to be in the book. If you're not in the Word, please get there. I met on Monday with a group of uh, young guys, mainly sophomore boys, at lunchtime. And uh, we get together to keep each other accountable. I ask them hard questions. I'm going around, okay, how are you doing in the Word? Are you, are you, are you feeding yourself? You're a big boy, you need to feed yourself. Doing pretty good. I have a bunch of really amazing young guys. That's one of the last guys says, well, my time in the Bible is not doing so good. Okay. Um, I used to have a friend who did some roping, and they had one of those cattle progs that you stick in the rear end of the calf to get him out to shoot real fast, and they go flying, and you go, oh, come over to my house, I'm going to stick that on your rear end, and we'll see if you can get your Bible reading going a little bit quicker here. That's what I told him. <laughs> You got to do it in, in their life habits. And I'm with 17, 18 year olds, and I keep telling them by the age of 18, 75% of people who come to Christ do it by 18. It doesn't mean that others can't, they do. I know some that have later in life. But by and large, once you get to 18, especially if you move out, you're on your own, you get more independent, more stubborn, stuck in your ways, and people just go their way and don't think they need God. So our encouragement to you and me is to study, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's a command. So there's our cattle prog right there. Let's go get them. Let's do it. We have to. We have to be in the word. God holds it very highly. There are not a lot of things we're taking to heaven. You know what we're taking? People. They're also going to be in the word. God has said his word is eternal. His word is going to be in heaven. Probably in a lot of ways, the living word, right? When we hear, I like to say on the farm, from the horse's mouth, right from us, straight from, the, from God himself. We'll be able to listen to him, but his word is so powerful and so wonderful and beautiful. So, there we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Um, yeah? It's such good stuff because it's good stuff. Mm -hmm. And I keep telling people, I didn't write the book. <laughs> My ideas. I'm, I've advertised I'm one of the most blessed men in the world. I've got an amazing God. My best time, I, I enjoy singing in church, but I was sharing with, I can't remember either, my son or Margie or somebody. My best times of worship is when I'm alone with God in my backyard, by myself, my headphones on. I sing and worship alone to God. And I've told him so many times, I have a glorious job. I get to teach the word. Why do you pick me? You know, Martine tells me, keeps telling me how sweet they, she thinks I am. I'm thinking, you'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel all that sweet. I told the Lord, why, why did you choose me? I have a glorious God. I had 52 years of a wonderful marriage. I've got wonderful kids. My son lives next door on the farm. He's my best friend. Thank you, Lord. I'm very grateful. I know you are, too. Let's, let's close in prayer. Lord, we, we come here today to the house of worship, to worship you, to look to your word. 
The truths are powerful. They're so good. Your word is alive. You said it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It's able to pierce, separating bone and marrow, Lord, uh, in, in our heart, in our, our spirit. And uh, if that ain't working, the problem's not with the sword. The problem's with my heart. It can get hard, Lord. Keep us soft. Keep us tender. Motivate us. Keep us going to your word, Lord. It's the bread of life. It's the water of heaven. It nourishes our souls. Lift us up. Keep us going. Give us direction and purpose in life. Yes, we want wonderful experiences, but we don't want to bank on the experiences. That's the caboose. We want to put our faith in the fact. And those facts are found in your word. Your word is a reliable, trustworthy, accurate, historical document. It's history. You were literally here on the earth. It records so many things that were seen by eyewitnesses, and other eyewitnesses saw them also. Nobody can say, well, that's not true. Well, yeah, wait a minute. I was there. I saw it. It's true. And it records supernatural events that you did, Lord, and only you can do. And uh, I'm grateful so often, Lord, that you would uh, redeem and set us free. So, Lord, we just glory in your compassion, your mercy. Bless his body here. Bless Mark as he deals with issues and problems that come his way. <coughs> Step out and be your man. Thank you for the wonderful ministry, the heart you've given from Riga High School. Lord, what a ministry, what a mission field. Just to save many, Lord, through their work, through what he does. And we're just thankful today for your sake, Jesus.
importance of us spending time with you and your word and, uh, and obeying the things that we read and study. Help us as we go from here to remember that and to be a part of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you.